when I start talking, you know that it's live. I'm gonna watch it this time. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Everybody see it? Yes. 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 Okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And tonight we are doing our second author showcase. We did an author showcase back in December, I believe, and it was a success. Everybody had a great time. We learned about all of our authors. Um, we gave away some free books and we just had an amazing time. Most of those authors I knew. This time we have some new authors who I am gonna be meeting for the first time with you. Or if we have guests that are watching tonight that already know our authors, that's even better because we're gonna be giving away free books throughout this um, author showcase tonight. So we're gonna be giving away free books. Every single author tonight has submitted their book. So everybody is going to have the chance to win a copy of all of the books that we are gonna be talking about tonight. We are going to get to know each one of our authors personally, together, talk about the different genres, what their passions are, why they wrote their books, all of that, including my very own book, Reality Check, that I published back in 2019. So we're gonna go ahead and get right in because we're a couple of minutes late. So we're gonna just jump right in, all right? So we have three male authors, which I am making a big deal out of because we had one male author in our first showcase. Now we have three. So I'm super excited about that. So I'm, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna um, introduce them first. So first off, we are gonna start with Mr. Turner. Hello, Mr. Turner. Hello, good evening, good evening. How are you doing today, sir? I'm good. It's Monday. Uh, you know how Mondays <laughs> go, but hey, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm walking above ground, so everything is great. Yes, yes. I cannot wait to talk about your book. And real quick, I just noticed something today. When I was looking at your book, it was in front of me. So I was looking at your book, making sure that I had it. And so I'm looking at it, I said, A. Page. Turner. And then I uh, said, what? A page Turner. Did you mean that? I did. Because everything <laughs> I write is a page Turner. <laughs> I was like, okay, why didn't I notice that before? So I felt a little slow, but then I was like, no, I like it. It's great. I, I love it. I love it. So I just had to point that out and I was a little slow at first. But I got it when I looked at your book. Okay, that's all that matters. You got it at the end, right? <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> all right. Next up, Mr. Shafiq Amin. How are you? I'm doing amazing. Amazing. Good. Good. Um, thank you for joining us. This is um, a first for us having you on the Speak Up and Inspire series, as well as all the other authors. So thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate you. My honor. Thank you. And we also have Mr. Matt Pullen. How are you tonight, sir? Good. Thank you very much for having me. Um, looking forward to a lively discussion. Yes, and sir. Yes, sir. I am too. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Thank You're you for, for coming on with us tonight. So we're going to go back to our ladies, back to our queens and introduce them as well. We're going to start with Miss Jeffrey. Hello, Miss Jeffrey. How are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I can't wait to talk about your book. I love when I see um, animated books and your book. Goodness, your book. <laughs> this is a big book, but <laughs> I started reading it and yes, very good. Very <laughs> nice. Very nice. I can't wait to talk about your book. Um, Thank we you. also have Ms. Shalia with us. Hello, Ms. Shalia. How are you? Uh, hi, Tiffany. I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Also a new face on um, the Speak Up and Inspire series. So thank you for joining us for the author showcase today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And again, that last but not least, we have Ms. Moore. How are you, Ms. Moore? I'm awesome. It's only about four here in California, so I still have a lot of my day left, and I'm excited to be here. <laughs> okay, nice. Now, with you, Ms. Moore, I kept looking at your picture, and I was like, how old is she? <laughs> <laughs> 
I look very young, but I'm yes. 30 this year. I mean, <laughs> still young, but I will be 30. But people think I'm like, like 20 or 18. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was looking at your picture and I was like, she looks so young. So I was about to say she's going to be our youngest author on the, on the podcast, but you know, maybe not, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I would like to talk, start off by talking about genre. So can everybody tell me um, what genre you are, your books are, or the books that I have in front of me, what genre of books are those? And anybody can start. Nonfiction. Gotcha. Nonfiction. So, how many nonfiction writers do we have on tonight? Myself, also. Very nice. Very nice. Autobiography, memoir. Okay. All right. Biography, memoir, not memoir. I can never say that 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 word right. <laughs> memoir. So specifically. <laughs> nonfiction. Um, Mr. Turner, what is what genre of book is yours? Uh, my genre book is urban fiction. Okay, urban fiction. I like it. I like it. Miss Jeffrey, what about you? I wrote a middle grade fantasy novel uh, set in the deep woods. Yes. Uh, and it's illustrated. Yes, it is. It is. It's beautiful. <laughs> illustrated too. Very, very nice. Thank nice. you. And Miss Moore, what about you? Uh, mine is a children's book. Um, and it's about ADHD, so there's fiction, I mean, there's non-fiction content, but it was written creatively. So it's children's book. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, and my book is also non-fiction fiction. fiction. Um, so basically it's a book based off of true, true life experiences of my own, but I gave it fictional characters. So that explains what, what mine is. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about or talk to each author um, specifically so that we can get to know you. So we're going to start off with Miss uh, Shalia. She is from Long Beach, California, best-selling author, speaker, and host <laughs> of the Girl Which Way podcast. She is also the president and CEO of Benet Girl Inc., a nonprofit organization for at-risk young women. Miss Shalia. Tell us about you. Is this your book, first book? No, this is, I have five books total. This was my first uh, bestseller. And this is a book that I wrote for first my daughter and then for young women as a whole, because I felt that there was such a need, especially in today's day and age for this sort of content. So I wanted to put it out there. Very, very nice. Very nice. So can you tell us the name of your book and what, what is your book about? So yeah, absolutely. So my name of my book is called Little Girl, Little Girl, Don't Get Lost in This World. It is nonfiction, but it's not really about, well, it's about my life. So it's not characters or anything like that. It's kind of like a guide for young women. I was a teen mom. And so I was on my way to Harvard and I had all these plans for my future. And then I wound up pregnant and everything kind of had you know fallen apart at that point if you will and so I ended up writing this book for my daughter initially because I felt that if I could get lost in the shuffle you know after life happened with me what about other girls and so I wanted my daughter to have it and then I realized it was so much bigger than that and it needed to be for everybody's daughter so there's chapters literally about everything that girls are going to go through from even teen pregnancy or you know sex or uh bullying, depression, setting goals. It's just based on everything that young women can potentially go through. And it's nothing vulgar or anything like that. It's just stating the facts and, you know, this is how you can make it through whatever happens to you. Very nice. Very nice. So I have um, your website up. So for everybody, it's Shalia Vene. Is it Vene? Am I pronouncing Vene. <laughs> okay. Shalia Vene. <laughs> Shalia <laughs> Benny. Shalia So that's S H A L E A A. I'm oh, sorry. S H A L E E A V E N N E Y dot com. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> that was a tongue twister. All right. So um, I have your um, website up right now. And it's Little Girl, Little Girl, Don't Get Lost in This World. Um, I know for me, I was not a teen parent. But I did have a lot of things that I went through as, as a teen, as a, as a young woman. So what has been the response to your book? 
Ms. Shalila? Wow, the response was so much more than I could have hoped for. It was more than I could have even thought it was going to be. I, I started to kind of just promote, you know, by mouth basically. And then I got this overwhelming response from lots of mothers and fathers and just people that are guardians of teenage girls wanting to order the book. And so they ordered the books for themselves to read with the girls. And it just became this whole, <laughs> this whole experience where we ended up doing these uh, weekly and monthly Facebook calls where we would all get together and kind of talk about it. And then it morphed into my nonprofit for young women as a way of reaching more girls. And then it morphed again into my uh, podcast now called Girl Which Way, because I just want to keep reaching these young women because it was just so overwhelming seeing how many people needed this. You know, there's a lot of fatherless daughters or motherless daughters or different circumstances that these young women are in right now that they wanted to kind of have someone to help them navigate through the waters, if you will. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Um, that's phenomenal. I know that my daughter right now is, um, she's 13. And of course we um, had something that happened with her that we felt that she needed to go to counseling. Mm -hmm. um, basically somebody was um, preying on her on Instagram. So wow. they were saying that they were a teenager and we found out that they were a grown man. So they were acting like a teenage girl, wow. but was a grown man. And so we went through that phase where it was like, we needed to talk to her about trafficking. Um, wow. We had to talk to her about being safe on the internet. Um, we had to talk to her about a lot of things, safety, not giving out your personal information and so forth. So um, I definitely understand you know, the need for a book like yours. Um, can you tell us what your other books, book titles are? Yeah, I have another book uh, called Black Girl Chronicles, and that is something that I wrote for my sisters. Anyone who's ever been, you know, pretty to be a black girl or, you know, someone wanted to touch your hair. <laughs> I, I wrote a collection of poetry for them. I have Love Letters to Jesus, uh, which is a collection of poetry for Christians and those that are not quite sure what their path is as of yet. I have a book uh, called With This Ring, which is a 31 day devotional for wives and those women that want to be wives one day um, in preparation for marriage. And I have Ugly Love, which is another book of poetry that is not about anything pretty about love. <laughs> it's all the worst parts of love, but it's fun. <laughs> wow, I love all of those titles. We might just have to have a, a show just for you, Miss Shalia. <laughs> talk about all <laughs> these <you>. titles. <laughs> a lot of I fun. Love <laughs> I love it. I love it. Doing a lot of positive things in the community. Can you tell us about your nonprofit? Yeah, my nonprofit, again, is an extension from my book, and I wanted to be able to reach, I know this in our communities, there's not a lot of, you know, summer camps and, you know, places where we can get away, you know, from where I come from, at least. And so I wanted to kind of fill that void in some way. So I initially wanted it to be a summer camp experience for young women, where the families don't have to pay anything, because I never wanted money to be a barrier for these families, because that's oftentimes what our problem is, why we can't go and experience things. So I have a few other ladies and, you know, everyone is vetted and, you know, background checked. And we take these young women, you know, away from the hood, if you will. And we go, you know, to camp and we pour into them, we enrich them, we teach them about businesses and life skills and marriage. And we do conferences and retreats. We do school supply giveaways. We do scholarships. It's just a way for us to just reach as many young women as we can. Very good. Very good. Um, can we get the website for your, um, for your nonprofit? Absolutely. So it's Vinny, again, V like Victor, E-N-N-E-Y, Girl Inc, I-N-C dot org. And we're always looking for more mentors for our women, for our young women. We also always are looking for more donations. Like I said, everything we do, the families never pay a dime. It's always on us. Okay. Very nice. Very, very nice. Um, I am a part of a huge um, network for domestic violence advocates wow. and also um, um, sexual assault advocates. I'm a survivor of both. And so I would definitely love to partner with you to talk. To, I would love that. Talk to your youths about both experiences and um, just kind of share some of some of my story and what I did to kind of to, to heal and to move, move wow. forward and become an advocate. So definitely would love to do that with you. 
Absolutely. We're definitely going to have to bring you on and partner with you for sure. You have a powerful story to tell. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. that and would love, love to partner with you again. Yeah. All righty. So I am going to move on to our next author. Um, let me see if there's any questions out there for you before we move forward. And I think that we are good. We don't have any questions right now. So if for anyone that is watching and you know, every single week when we have our guests, guests are always, or guests that are watching are always welcome to ask any questions, um, to put anything in the chat, to talk directly to our guests, whatever it is that you would like to do. We will make sure that they see it and that if there's a question that we ask it. So if anyone is watching and you have any questions, please make sure that you do a comment and I will see it. So we are going to move on because of the book that you wrote, Ms. Shalia, I thought mm -hmm. that it would be great for us to go to Mr. Shafiq next. And I'm going to tell you why. So his book, A Message to a Fatherless Generation. Oh, wow. Yes. So I think that ties in really good with mm -hmm. your book, Ms. Shalia, because you talked about being a teen mom. You talked about, you know, um, children that are raised without, without the, the other parent or mm -hmm. being in single parent families. So I thought that that would be a good um, segue into Mr. Shafiq. So Mr. Shafiq, tell us about a message to a fatherless generation. But before that, tell us about you. Sure. Um, name is uh, Dr. Shafiq Amin. I've been in uh, public and private education for the last 25 years. Um, I um, hold various degrees and I currently teach at Norfolk State University, um, go Spartans. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> um, a proud uh, HBCU grad. And um, the reason that I decided to write a message to a fatherless generation is because um, I didn't see any other books like that on the market. Um, being in public education for the past 25 years, teaching mostly African-American young men and women, but specifically the young men, I always wondered why they were so, so angry, so disconnected, mm. um, especially towards women. And then they would always be very, very respectful towards me. And I was wondering why there was only a, a one-way street. So I dug a little deeper and found out that the majority of these young men from um, middle school through high school, all the way up to my uh, undergraduate and graduate classes at Norfolk State, uh, these young men um, were for the most part being raised without a father in their life. And they were angry. And they, when you're angry, sometimes uh, you unleash your anger at the person who is closest to you. And that mm -hmm. tended to be their mothers or just women in general. And so I thought it was necessary to write a book, but the book was not to blame fathers who were not in the lives of their sons, but the book was just a cry for help to have the fathers reconnect with these young mm -hmm. men who desperately need them in order to be whole. Wow, wow. So we've had, we have male panels sometimes where we talk to um, the men that are leaders in the community who talk about various subjects. We've had a male panel about domestic violence. We've had a male panel about being the head of household. Um, we've also had a male panel when all of the um, riot, well, a lot of the riots were going on um, surrounding George Floyd's uh, murder just talking to men about different subjects that we feel that men should, should, should voice about. So your book definitely is one that needs to be talked about. I found that working in the school system, I've also worked in the school system for the last six, seven years. I'm a social worker um, currently. And we found that children who have positive male role models in their lives strive when it comes to interpersonal relationships, with their education, um, and also when it comes to criminal, criminalization or not. So 
when you have men that are positive role models in the community volunteering in the schools, you get even more results, especially among um, minority students, not just African-Americans, but also um, even in the Hispanic population, um, but also even in the Caucasian population, every population, but definitely in the, in the minority population. When you have strong men in the community volunteering and present, then you have greater impacts when it comes to the children. So has that been your experience? Oh, absolutely. Um, I happen to pick African-American young men because those are normally the individuals that I, um, I have interaction with, but it, it crosses the gamut from white young boys to Hispanic to Native American. It, boys need a model. They need to be able to have someone, if you can imagine the impact that a kid would have with a, a positive male figure in that school and how that can make a difference in that child's life. Imagine if they had that positive male image in their home every day, what kind of man that young man will turn out to be. And you know, one thing I really wanna get across is that men tend to be prideful and we tend to hold things in. And when they make, when we make mistakes, a lot of times we have a hard time asking for forgiveness. But when it comes to our, our children, when it comes to our sons, it is incumbent upon us to realize that children are resilient. Mm -hmm. And sometimes all it takes is, I'm sorry, I could have been a better father, I'll do better, please forgive me, let's take baby steps to form a relationship. And you would be surprised, the young men with all the anger inside, all they want their father to say is, I'm sorry, I want to be back in your life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found that um, being a single mother for a, for a while, <laughs> that I found myself battling that question of their father was always present. So I'm not saying that he wasn't, but the kid, my children lived with me. So mm -hmm. there was those times where it was like, okay, I needed to reach out to their dad because I needed him to talk to him about being respectful um, I needed to talk to him about even potty training. Like he's a boy, I'm a girl. How am I supposed to potty train him? <laughs> um, talking about potty training, um, even up to now that he's 13 years old, um, you know, respecting his sister, um, um, understanding that the way he dresses is a reflection of how people are going to perceive him, you know, even to education, getting good grades. So having a male figure is definitely important in our boys' lives because as a single mom, I can't, I can't teach him what you can teach him. I can't teach him those things that he needs to learn from a positive male role model, even though I can teach him what I would like him to be like or do, especially when it comes to how he treats women and how he treats people and giving back to his community, but I'm not a man. Well, one thing I can, one thing I can say is that many, I don't want to say many, some men have dropped the ball and we have put the yeoman's work on the women to clean up after our mess. And they're there with the children dealing with all of their anxieties and their heartaches. So it's time for us to step up. And, and we can do it um, and our children need us and we just have to find that vehicle to, to make that connection something that's not temporary but lasting. Yes, very much so, Brandy, very much so. So what has the response been to your book? And that's probably a question I'll ask everyone. What, is, what has been the response to your book? Oh, it's been fantastic. I, I'm on Amazon and on um, Barnes and Noble and um, the sales have been terrific. Um, I have many of my students at Norfolk State have purchased the book, and I also teach in a, a Martin Luther King Middle School in Maryland. And um, I have students who, uh, you know, their their mothers will purchase the book for the young men, and um, it, it's been amazing. I'm I'm ready. It, it was published in 2020. I'm I'm ready to uh to come out with the second edition because the the man has been that great. 
Very nice. Very nice. Well, um, I definitely feel that it is um, a message that needs to be heard and definitely fitting a message to a fatherless generation. Um, very, very good topic. And one I would definitely like for our male panel to, to talk about in more detail. Um, so I would love to reach out to you about that, getting our male panel to read your book mm -hmm. and we talk about it. I Absolutely. think that would be great. I do too. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, we are going to go to um, Mr. Page Turner. <laughs> We're going to go to Mr. Page Turner. He has the Man. Emancipation of Limits. The Emancipation of Limits. Tell us about you, Mr. Turner. So there I was, right? right. Um, Born and raised outside Chicago, uh, from a great from a uh, background is uh, you know, uh, Shafiq is saying basically my dad wasn't in my life, but I was um, I was surrounded by great men, and because I was surrounded by great men, uh, I flourished uh, as a child. Even though I have the thoughts of who my dad was, or a missing part of me, because I don't know exactly who he is in order to understand why I react to things or uh, what's in my DNA through his side of the family, right? So um, I joined the military at the age of uh, 19 uh, due to a incident that almost took my life, right? I got held at gunpoint on my way to a basketball game. So my uncle uh, told me, hey, you need to get out of here and join the military. So I joined the military in 1990. Uh, I left the Navy and went into the Army in 1998, and I just retired in 2019. Uh, I also made history. I'm the first African-American to reach the rank of Chief One Officer Five in the Transportation Corps since its existence of 1942. Wow. So, uh, so after I made that feat, uh, I retired. Um, I took a job working for the Special Operation Forces as a logistics planner. Uh, when they go in doing raids, uh, taking people out and kidnapping people. I, I ensured they had all the logistics they needed in order to make missions. So um, I have two daughters. They're both grown women now. And I have a great relationship thanks to the relationship I didn't have with my dad. So uh, during COVID, I was bored to death being stuck in the house. So I decided to write a book. So The Emancipation of Limits is my first book. Wow. That is a lengthy resume. <laughs> Very lengthy. Wow. Okay. So um, tell us what the Emancipation of Limits is about. Well, I, you know, being bored during COVID, I wanted to write a book that commemorated Black Wall Street. So I did a little research on Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I understood how that community strived, right? So it was a stereotype that that was something that we couldn't do uh, as a people. So as I read and I understood how the businesses flourished, how the money stayed in that community longer than six hours, it stayed in that community for about 10 days and they had black businesses and they had black schools and they had black hospitals, they had black everything. So, uh, you know, the normal narrative, it was a black man who was accused of raping a white woman uh, was an excuse for uh, the whites back then to actually destroy it. And uh, it later came out that it was consensual and they actually got married a couple years uh, after uh, that incident that no one talks about. So this book, The Emancipation of Limits, is about a character named Richie who wanted to uplift his community to recreate Black Wall Street. And he only means that he can do this with, with the use of uh, money from the drug trade. So he sold drugs in order to take this money to pour back, as in, back into his community to build hospitals, to build strip malls, to give scholarships to kids and so on and so forth, and uh, to keep the black dollar in the community, not six hours, but 10 days. So he, he, he did this feat. Uh, the Emancipation of Limits is a three book series being written in reverse chronological order. So this book is where he made it. Uh, the community is striving. Uh, black people are working, uh, the unemployment rate, uh, you know, in different communities across the Midwest is flourishing from what he's doing. So now he wants to stop doing the drug trade to go 100% legit 
but his connect, he's making so much money from for them, they don't want to let him out. So they're doing things and attacking his vulnerabilities in order to keep him in. So uh, that is the that is the first book that should have been written last, but I wrote it first. And now I'm working on a second book called The Proclamation of a God. This is how he came with this ideology in order to do this. And he formed his team, which is all military, in order to take this effort, put it into the black community and push it around the world. Very nice, very nice. Mm. Um, I know that I am in a group called, um, I believe it's, I know it's something Black Wall Street. So it's basically promoting, um, building up black businesses, supporting black businesses on, on Facebook and it's, do, and it's doing really well. So um, what you just said, just reminded me of that about trying to give back to the community um, putting the money back into the community, supporting each other and so forth. Um, with this, I see that, I'm assuming that is you on the front cover, correct? That is that, that handsome guy called me. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't want to assume, but yes. Okay, so the character in the book, are they you or is it someone like you? Did you write this based off of your personality? Or tell us about that. <laughs> well, yeah, I wrote the book based off of my personality and, and also things that happened in my life uh, before I joined the military, right? So, you know, people would say, oh, man, why another book about drugs, right? So the drugs <laughs> is just the entertainment piece of the book. The book has underlining messages about Black minds. It has underlining messages on if we work together regardless if it's, if it's drugs or we're selling tomatoes or whatever, that if we, if we stick together in our community and pull our resources, that we can do great, great things. So just the drug take drug trade element is just the entertainment piece of it, right? Because everybody likes to be entertained. So it's just underlining messages. Uh, my books have strong Black women leads. Um, and the characters of the book, without them, Richie couldn't accomplish what he accomplished. So I just want to do something different uh, when it comes to Black women in my book. I don't want to do the stereotypical, you know, weave down to their ankles, attitude, sassiness, <laughs> twerking. I want the positive queens that Black women are and, and express what they've done to the world because everything comes from a Black woman. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for sharing with us about your book. Um, I know you said that during COVID-19, you got bored. So what else did you accomplish while you were bored? Because this is a pretty good, big accomplishment here, Mr. Turner. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I wrote a book, I, uh, of course, and I actually uh, took another job working with the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, as a requirements officer for cyber. So all these new widgets that's coming out uh, is probably is going to be coming across my desk or so I had something uh, to do with it. So I also filmed a book trailer uh, for this book. And right now I have 120,000 views and it's, and, it's, and it's racing fast. So uh, wow. people automatically think that it's a movie because I actually hired actors and and I did the whole gamut. You know, I had places and locations to where I filmed at. And uh, it is a very professional trailer that looks like that you're in the movie watching a preview of a, another movie. It, it is awesome. Very nice. Where can we find the trailer? Uh, you can find the trailer on my Facebook page. You can find it on my Instagram, on my website. All of them are the same. A uh, dot P A J Turner uh, and dot com for my website. Very, very nice. Very nice. Um, I am on your website right now. So let me share my screen, my screen. So we see right here your book um, over here. You can join the mailing list. What can they expect on your mailing list? What kind of things are we going to receive when we sign up? Oh, uh, you'll receive chapter one right away. Uh, you'll see chapter one of my book. And uh, you will also uh, receive uh, my blog. I have a, a blog that's called uh, Growing, uh, Grown, Growing, Grown, and Grown. Uh, it's basically, yeah, Growing, Grow, Growing, Now Grown. It's basically <laughs> uh, just talking topics about uh, different things from fatherhood to uh, marriage to it's not all about sex. 
um, you know, different topics that will hit home to uh, pretty much everybody. So, and that's my favorite topic, who have you helped today, right? So being in the military, you know, I have two kids that's, that's biologically mine, but I've mentored over 3,000, right? So it's always about giving back. Now, I've mentored all walks of life, but I always take a special emphasis on African-Americans because a lot of us come from broken homes, no dads, or we experience trauma that we carry throughout life. So I always took a special emphasis on, uh, on ensuring that I gave them the mentorship and then pay it forward. You help somebody, uh, you know, have them turn around and help someone else, you know, to, to make it full circle, because it's always about giving back. And once you give back, the universe will give it back to you tenfold. So, uh, so that's it. I just want to uh, put out messages, positive messages. And books isn't, you know, what I really want to do. What I want to do is book to the foundation. What I want to do is go into film. And, and do positive films about African-American history, whether it's from uh, recreating the Black Wall Street, whether it's doing the Emancipation of Limits, what I'm working on right now, or just any film that highlights, um, you know, the plight and success of uh, African-Americans and uh, do away with the stereotypes. Very nice, very nice. Um, I like that you um, talked about having strong female leads in your book. Um, that was really important to me um, when I wrote my book, um, Reality Check. My, um, my book, Reality Check, is really about me surviving sexual assault. Um, I was assaulted in 2005, which was the reason why I moved to North Carolina um, sooner than I planned because after I was assaulted, then he actually started stalking me. Oh. Um, so I moved to North Carolina from DC um, after, being, after being raped or assaulted. And so my book, Reality Check, is really about the incident that happened. Um, but all of the characters in the book are very, are very strong. Um, very strong female characters in the books because I thought that, that was important for people to to read about strong women mm. and not only African-American women but strong women in general and how much we go through that you don't see because a lot of us are mothers um, we're professional women and so a lot of times when we're out in the community or out in public we're smiling we're helping others and so forth but you never know what we're going through sometimes at home until yeah. really until you really get to know us. Um, so in my book, Reality Check, I'm talking about the experience. It starts off very strong because it's talking about the assault in the first chapter. So it starts off very strong, very emotional. Um, but the characters, all of the female characters in the book are very strong characters, um, very, very confident despite the trauma that they go through in it. And then we have, I have very strong men who are supporting the women who are going through the trauma in the book. So I really appreciate you bringing that out because not only do our children need to see strong men, they need to see strong mothers. They need to see strong women. They need to see professional women and professional men, as well as African-American men and women who are doing great things in a community who are strong, who are raising their families, even if they're single parents. So I really appreciate you um, including strong females in your book. That's really, really important, especially coming from a man, and a man, a men's perspective. Um, mm. I think it's really, really important for our children to be able to read. So I really appreciate that. I am going to move on and we are going to come back to our authors that we've already talked to, but I want to make sure that everybody gets this, the chance to really talk about themselves and their books and their experiences. So we are going to um, move on to, I know Ms. Hope is not here. We're gonna move on to Mr. Matt, Mr. Matt Pullen. I wanted to talk to you because I was reading your biography and in your biography, you told me that you were born and raised in um, Iowa, that you're the youngest of seven children, um, but that also that there was abuse um, physically, emotionally, verbally by both parents. 
and that it left lifelong emotional and physical scars. So the reason why I'm coming to you next is I kind of want to keep with the flow, but this is a perfect example that neglect, um, single parents, abuse, um, uh, having physical scars or emotional scars from childhood, that those are things that happen in all families, regardless of race. Um, I know that African-American families, of course, you see, that, see it in the news, you know, this family, you know, someone got killed on the block or some, something like that. But abuse, neglect, um, all these kinds of things happen not only in African-American families, but they also happen in, in other generations and other races, um, regardless of where you were brought up. And so, Mr. Matt, I definitely want to let's let's go into you next. Let's talk yeah. about your book. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And first, let me start with saying I want to thank the two gentlemen that came before me that are it is really difficult. Uh, one of them said it. It's very difficult to actually be candid about your feelings. A lot of men don't do that. So I was kind of surprised when I have two grown adult men that are actually have the same viewpoint that I do. And they're able to talk about it because it's not easy. And I'll echo, echo one of his sentiments also. It, it just takes one person uh, to touch a child's life to set it in the right direction. That happened for me. It was a, it was a guidance counselor. And that happened for me. And, and I reached out to that guidance counselor uh, 30 40 years after the fact and let him know let him and his son know that they made a profound impact on me uh just as i felt that was something i needed to do but anyway my story i've had a cup of coffee and i might talk a lot so i'll get a lot in on you oh no uh, you're fine go ahead <laughs> <laughs> uh so i'm the youngest of seven born and raised in iowa um i emancipated myself when i was 17 years old my parents were not good people um uh, my father left me with a seizure disorder due to blunt force trauma to the head. Um, I've got a lot of different, uh, I don't say disorders, I've got a lot of different medical issues, but it's never been a crutch. I've never focused on any of the, the I'll say the, the things that, um, I always say the things God did to me, or God, God, God did, excuse me, for me, not to me. All these things, like I have a seizure disorder, I have a blood disorder where I'm prone to blood clots. I have a DVT in my left leg right now as we speak that'll never come out. And anything that's happened though, and he even gave me an addiction. All these things that he did for me um, led me to go through a recovery program. And uh, it was, I think Mr. Turner was talking about in the recovery program, you're taught at the very end of kind of your recovery after the, you've gone through this process, you need to reach around and grab the person behind you and help pull them through because that's who got you to where you're at. You didn't make it where you're at on your own. You got through God's help. You got through a strong woman. You know, I had four very strong sisters and we're all doing okay, but I just imagine how much better we could all be doing if we would have had parents that loved and cared about us. Mm -hmm. Right. But I have four very strong sisters that, um, they crack the whip in their relationships with their husbands because they want a certain life and they know they're demanding of it. They're, they're deserving of it. They went through a rough life and they've got great kids. They've got great relationships. And I'm, I'm very proud that they are so strong, you know, so that's a testament to them. And I, I hundred percent agree. You need to have a strong male and female role models for our, for our youth. And they need to be positive as well. Um, so regarding the book, um, I, I was in finance for about 20 years and I got tired. I didn't realize I was tired of being in the role I was in. I was tired of working for the company. They weren't nice people. Um, so one day I just quit my job and I went through a lot of changes. I re reconciled with two of my sisters that I hadn't seen in over 15 years. I reconciled with them. Um, I um, worked on myself a lot and I decided, you know what? I thought I was ready to go get another job. And so I did. And I realized I still had unresolved issues and I needed to get them out. And for me, one of the things I need, I need my voice to be heard. That's it. As long as I'm heard, I'm fine. I don't need really anything else. You don't need to, no parades, I don't need money, but I need my voice to be heard. And so I need to write the book to be able to do that. And now I'm going to figure out what the next path is. I've been putting out there on social media. I've been launching it myself, my own different way. Um, and I just got it. I had edited with a couple of friends and decided 
was told by multiple individuals I should have it professionally edited. So that now that's done and I'm working with a couple of new publicists to put it out there in some different areas. I too would like to see how far I could take this to see if I can make it in some sort of movie. Who knows? But um, I've never really had a dream, right? I've been in fight or flight mode for like 35 years, just making sure I had a job, making sure I had income, making sure I took care of what I needed to while still giving back. And now I'm like, let's chase this dream. I have a little bit of time, but, and a little bit of money. So if anybody else wants to buy my book, please feel free. I could use it. <laughs> As everybody, buy everybody's if you want to. But, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, that's it. And, and I, I honestly, I, I appreciate just being on this kind of forum. It's, it's nice to hear other, uh, other people's, what they've struggled with and we're from a race or a culture doesn't matter. We're all the same. It's, we all have this similar hurts, habits and hangups and, and we all might deal with them differently, but we're all the same. Yeah. All, we all struggle. Yes, yes. Um, yes, I really um, appreciate your story. Um, and I'm going to say that because I, um, I'm of mixed race. I have uh, different races in my family. So even though I do, um, I do claim being African-American, I claim all of the, my cultures um, because I just feel it's important. And I also teach my children about the different cultures that we have in our blood. So um, I was really happy to have you on. And then when I read your bio, I was like, this is going to fit in great because of the other books and the other authors. Um, I always think it's important that even though um, I'm an African-American woman and I support African-American causes, and I feel that um, we have a voice that needs to be heard. I also understand that that these that some of the same issues that African Americans um, deal with, other races deal with as well. Um, and it, so it was really nice that you were transparent in your bio. It was pretty straight to the point. You told me who you were. You told me, you know, what you had been through. And I really appreciate that because, again, that's hard. It's hard for a man to come forward and say, "Hey, I've been, I was abused as a child." or my father left me or something like that. That's, that's, that's really hard to put out there in, in the public eye and say those <laughs> things. Yeah. Um, One of the things I learned, and this is, this is what I pass on to other uh, if it's male or female, anybody, this kind of, I know has been struggling. It's, and this is to me, at least is very true. Once you share your pain with somebody else, it cuts it in half. Mm every time you do so the more times you can tell it um the more you can share it the easier it becomes and and after a while i remember i was a leader within the celebrate recovery program and i was teaching other individuals you know some of the things i went through just to see if they would be beneficial get them along their way and um that was just a, a you know one of the fundamental keys is you you always look behind you you always looked and and it was very helpful to share that with myself and I got to where I could share it with complete strangers kind of like I'm doing tonight but honestly because of the comments I feel like you know I relate to some of you already with what you've gone through I'm like I know a lot more who you are just from those few comments so I appreciate your guys' candor as well I mean it, it makes me feel at ease so anyway I'll keep talking if you let me <laughs> very nice very nice well they say that some of the best mentors are those that have been through it so mm -hmm. um, if you are providing peer support to people who may have had an addiction or who may have had past abuse or may have um, grown up in a single parent family, then that's not only therapy for you, it's ther therapy for them too, to be able to see where you, where you come from. I have a ways to go, Mr. Turney. He did, he said he's got over 3000 in, I bet I've got six. So <laughs> I've got a ways to go. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't really think it's it's the number. I it's think not. It's, it's the effect. It's the effect. You're saying I'm coming for you. I got. It. Yes, yes. Well, well, thank you for that. I definitely appreciate that. So we're looking at your book here, and yeah. it's titled Seven Broken Souls." Seven Broken Souls." I'm not sure if you saw my message that my son handed me the book. So my son actually had it in his room. Good. So, <laughs> so, um, Did he like seven, it? Will he give me a review? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell him. You have to do a review or not? So, Seven Broken Souls. Tell us, tell us about the title, even though I'm pretty sure I can guess, but I want you to tell us. Yeah. So, uh, the story is about, um, obviously, myself and my six other brothers and sisters and what we went through. 
It's mm -hmm. more um, because of the age. Uh, there's 13 years age difference between myself and the, my oldest sister. Because of my age, I mean, I didn't really know three or four of them, I would say, growing up because they were already out by that time when I could actually get to know them. And so I tell a little bit about their story and how they're phenomenal people and they always will be. But I also, I deconstruct how they went from these phenomenal individuals. And again, they still are to um, what they're struggling with. And I can see it. It took me, third, and, I, and don't get me wrong, I throw a lot of, cast a lot of dirt on my own self. It took me 35 years to figure out what I was doing wrong. Like personally, I did okay for myself professionally, but personally, um, every relationship with a woman failed. And you, after a, a while, you can't keep blaming it on the, the women saying it's all their fault. Sometimes you, you got to look inwards. And, and I thankfully had one person that told me I need to look inwards and I did. And kind of all this stuff kind of mushroom clouded. It all just came up. And, but, and I'm trying to ultimately, I would love to get my family back into a recovery program. There's nothing like what I have been through that, that I didn't realize. I thought there was just for an addiction. I thought they're just for certain things. I didn't realize women that were abused or, or had incest, rape, anything whatsoever. They don't have to have an addiction, but it's extremely helpful for them. There's just, like I said, this opened up my mind and my eyes. And um, I had a lot of different, like therapists have said also, I should write a book. Um, and just finally, when my, like I said, when my voice, I felt like needed to be heard. I'm like, you know what? I don't have a job. And I think this is God telling me you should write a book and we'll see where it goes. Who knows? Maybe it's, uh, this is the last, po last podcast I'll get to do, but you know, that's fine. You know, right. Either way, I'm, I'm happy just to get the voice out. And again, it's, it's nice to have other individuals. Men don't talk about our feelings. Um, we don't talk about, um, you know, the military is a part of this too. That's why I definitely like to thank Mr. Turn for his, you know, his service, but I don't feel like we do enough for, anybody that's coming back you know if they've had a um, some sort of disability because they've they've gave a, an arm or a leg for our country we need to do just as much for their mind as we do to their body to heal that as well when they come back so and, and they, this is just my two cents and i apologize if i'm on the rant but they they should give be giving some sort of preferential treatment also let's get them in the workplace let's like, these guys just defended this male female just defended our country let's 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 make sure that they have a line in place uh because they've been out of the marketplace for a while right so. right sorry okay. we had um a podcast with um Ab Ab abdullah i don't want to say his name right, wrong abdullah um and he's a veteran and he talked about um how being a veteran and coming home and you know witnessing different things and how his mental health was not made a priority when he got out. Um, he also talked about how the military affected him, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, so forth. Um, so that was a good conversation um, with him. And Mr. Turner, I'm sure he also could share, you know, some of the some of his experiences of being in the service for so long, and you know, just coming out. And there's a lot of there's it's it, sometimes it's really sad when even talking to a friend of mine the other day, she was saying that she's a veteran, that she um, suffered some trauma while she was in there. And when she came out, they, they gave her uh, her papers. They told her how much her disability check was and no one offered her counseling. Yeah. Um, and so that was something that, you know, her and I talked about in, in depth about was, you know, how do you feel about that? And is that something that you feel is an issue that needs to be addressed. And she said very much so, that the mental health of, of, of veterans or anyone in the service, even while they're still in the service, should be, should be priority because of what you see and what you go through and, and even losing friends, um, maybe to war or just you know, in the field or so forth. So um, that's, a, that's a really, really good point that you just brought out, Mr. Cohen. Um, Mr. Turner, did you wanna make a comment? Um, one hundred percent, right? So, you know, after doing twenty-eight years in the military, and they put you out in the real world, right? You are confined to a way of living and the way that you do business for 
10 years, 20, however long that you spend in there. Um, and they just kind of throw you out, you know, to the wolves. Hey, thank you for your service. You know, there you go. So anyone who has ever been overseas in the Middle East who's been in war has some sort of PTSD, without a doubt, right? You get into an unfamiliar place, the temperatures is like 150 degrees over there, and you trust no one that's outside of a U.S. uniform, right? So, and then you're over there from up to 12 months, sometimes to 15 months, being in that environment, always on watch, always on the lookout. So even now, I find myself when I'm driving on the road and there's a paper bag in the middle of the road, I would drive around it because I would think that it was an IED or an explosive. So there's so many things that you carry back with you uh, from military service, from war. But I will say that the VA has made great strides in trying to get soldiers the help that they need because the suicide rate in the military is off the charts. Every day a soldier was taking his life. Every day a, a soldier who's retired or has been discharged from the military take their life. So it, it is it is huge, right? So probably about 10 years ago, I had a soldier who lost a limb and it wasn't even during conflict. He was on R&R, &R, he got a flat tire, he went outside the car to fix it on the highway and he got hit, lost the leg, right? So him with along with other uh, amputees were having issues with getting appointments they were coming into appointments with duct tape around their prosthetics because they were so stretched out but the va has taken great strides on uh, ensuring that soldiers are uh, taken care of or have a uh, direct link to some kind of behavioral health counseling but it, it's still a problem you know it's still a problem Yes, sir. Thank you for adding that in there. Um, Matt, how do your how does your siblings feel about you publishing your book? Um, so it's very interesting. And I pointed this out to a couple of my nieces and nephews that are kind of they, they're in an awkward spot, right? They don't know whether to be pro their uncle that's written a book or not to defend their parents. Um, so it's a split with I have four siblings two of them are brothers that are they're basically full-blown alcoholics and they won't ever see any of this until they stop drinking they won't see any of it and so and i don't believe they've read the book but they've disowned me and two of my other sisters who i don't believe have read the book and have not gone through counseling either along with my two brothers i again i don't think they've read the book because they've never asked me for a copy um and then I have two other sisters that I reconcile with that, funny enough, they have been through their own form of recovery. They have read the book and they're very proud of me and they're very happy. And they and I have a better relationship now with them than I ever had. And it was very strained because they didn't want any part of what they called, you know, the drama. Mm -hmm. They want they set their own boundaries. And yeah, so I'm my ultimate goal would be to have my brothers and sisters, all of them read this book, understand it and get some of the help that they need because it's we're very big workers right mm -hmm. we were we didn't grow up on the farm but we we're kind of right next to the farm we're working on the farm but this has been going through recovery program is harder than anything i've ever done in my life and i've worked three different jobs getting through high school and college i mean I, i've always worked and this is harder than any 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 12 hours shift i put on the farm put out there in the uh anyway um so that's, but that's my family. Um, but what's nice is I've had other sibling or other friends and people that I didn't even know were my friends that have said, wow, um, they've ordered the book for me. And most of them are female. They're not very many males that, that will, that are going to reach out. I think maybe some females will have their significant others read the book, but mm -hmm. there's um, uh, not been very many males that have read the book, but um, also, Again, the, the females that have read it, they they have been through their own kind of personal trauma. So it's it's it, we're, we can all relate in that aspect. And it's it's other people I didn't know. Again, they're reaching out. So it's very it's kind of heartwarming. It's, and it's I've gotten a very for me, that's a positive response because I didn't know what to think. And then the other other side of the spectrum, though, other family members that have not that need to go through some type of recovery or therapy and haven't. This hits a sharp note with them. Right. Understood. Understood. It may just be 
a sentence or two sentences in the book, mm -hmm. right? That's enough to trigger them and, and they don't they don't care for it. Right. And then I understand. Gotcha. I understand. Um, I I can attest to that, and I'm sure um, other authors like maybe Ms. Shalia um, or um, Mr. Chafik maybe is that when our friends and family read our book, that especially is personal, then you're either going to get people that are yay or nay. There's usually not. They're usually not in the middle. <laughs> um, either they love it and they're proud of you or they hate it. And a lot of times when people hate something that is so personal, it's because there's something that they need to address themselves. Yep. Um, and so this is your journey, Mr. Mr. Pullen, this is your journey. Um, and you put your journey on paper. Not very many people can do that. Like Ms. Shalia, like myself, like uh, Mr. Chafik, like, like all of the authors on here. It's really hard to put your story on paper. It really is. And then to put it on paper and then publish it for other <laughs> people to read it, which opens you up to a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I can say, and I'm sure the other authors would agree that writing is definitely therapeutic mm -hmm. and that it gives you a new appreciation for your journey. And your family, they might, the ones who have not read it, may not ever read it um the ones who have read it good for them that they supported you in that way but one thing I will say is that there's going to be people that will support you who still won't read your story um and my mom she won't read my book because she knows that it was a painful part of my past um, one that I didn't disclose to her until I wrote the book because I gave her a warning. Mm -hmm. This is what the book is about. <laughs> she still hasn't read it. My wow. sisters have read it. Well, two of my sisters have read it. Um, yeah. yeah, my friends have read it. And um, there are people that were like, wow, that's a lot that you put out there. Um, for me, it's my journey. It's your journey. Yeah. And I'm so thankful that you wrote it because you, even if you've helped six people, you've mm -hmm. helped somebody, including yourself. So and you, you yeah. guys are helping me too. I appreciate your comments because it is the things I don't know. I don't know the things I don't know. Right. So it's important to understand that those people that don't support me necessarily, they do, they're just not, they're going to show it in really weird ways until I figure out how to. Right. Right. Other right. people give me valuable piece of information too that I didn't realize would be like relevant and that very much is. You gave me a new way to look at it, so thank you. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, sir. No problem. No problem at all. All right. So we're gonna move on to. Um, I'm 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 gonna say this. I'm not saving the best for last. So don't think I'm going in any <laughs> priority order. I'm not. <laughs> I'm just kind of keeping with the flow of the conversation. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to go to Miss um, Alana Moore. And we're going to save our fantasy for our last one because that's going to be our, our, our upper. <laughs> we talked about some, some really strong subjects tonight, some really strong subjects. So Miss Jeffrey is going to close us out with some, some, with some fantasy fiction. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to okay. Ms. Alana Moore. How are you? Good. I'm good. I'm excited to be here and I feel empowered by everything I've heard so far. Um, and my book that I'll talk about in a little bit, um, it goes in line with what everybody is saying because it's about empowering children. Um, but uh, a little bit about me. I, uh, let's see where to start. So I am an HBCU grad too, um, like Mr. Speak. Yes. Um, Spelman <laughs> College. <laughs> um, and so I was a child development major there. Um, and then I got my master's in marriage and family counseling um, from a place called Walden University. Um, what really got me into mental health um, in the first place was when I was 11 years old. Um, well, a few things. So one, uh, when I was about 11, I was at a church retreat of mine. And something that they do is they have like testimonies, testimonials. Um, so a lot of people my age, between the ages of maybe 
10 and 18 were talking about some really deeply rooted traumas. Again, I didn't label them as traumas at the time. I didn't know what to label them. I just knew that people, my peers were going through significant, a significant amount of things. Um, and then my best friend at the time being one of them, a few months later, she made a suicide attempt. Hmm. And I was really distraught about that. Um, we went to go see her. I'm so thankful that, you know, she didn't follow through, but I was very shocked at the time that someone so vibrant, so awesome, so great, even thought about doing that, you know? Um, and again, me being 11, I'm just trying to process everything. Um, and so from that point on, I told myself that if I want God to use me in whatever way possible to empower as many people as possible so that they don't have those thoughts, you know, um, I just want to give people a space, um, kind of like uh, Mr. Uh, Matt was saying to just be heard, because I feel like that's just what everyone wants is to be heard, you know, to be seen, to be understood. So I just wanted to provide a space for that. And I felt like that at 11 and now 29. Um, I am a mental health therapist. I work with families, young adult children um, and provide the space for them. And I love it. It's so just refreshing for me. Um, but a little bit going into this story um, called ADHD is my superpower. Um, I have a son who's six years old. Um, I'm a single parent. And when he was about, honestly, when he was about 11 months old, I was like, my baby has more energy and more strong will than any of these other babies that are hanging out with us. Like, I know something is going on. Um, Cause I also worked with children with autism for about four years. So I just was like something, he's got an extra dose of, of, of zest. So um, then as you know, um, he grew a little bit two and three, there was some trouble with preschool, like his energy levels where it was starting to be a challenge. Um, I would try to take him to extracurriculars and that was a challenge um, because of some defiance and some strong will and energy. Um, and so one time I just found myself crying and like, okay, like, what do I do as the parent? I just want my child to be great, but like, I can't even take them to gymnastics or Taekwondo or anything like that, because there's just a lot of energy and he's not listening and all of these different things. Right. So, um, he got, I took him to get like assessed at a guy, a child guidance center, and he was diagnosed with ADHD. And so my first initial reaction was like mourning. I was mourning the loss of maybe a neurotypical child at the time. And like, oh my gosh, what does life mean for him now? That's what I was thinking maybe three plus years ago. Then as I continued on my journey, I'm like, but my son is amazing. There's so much about him um, that people don't see, that I see every day, like the creativity, the mind that he has, it, go, it goes so fast. He notices things that I don't notice. This was at a young age. So I'm like, there's beautiful things about him. And I, as his mother, need to look at this differently um, because he has a superpower. Like he has things that I want, you know what I, I mean? And so <laughs> I said, I need to empower my child. I need to, I want to make him feel seen and heard because he was already getting enough comments from preschools about, you know, he won't sit down, he won't do this. And I didn't want that to become a narrative in his, his mind that all I am is a burden or people are always bothered by me. I'm like, no, you know, you are incredible. So I, in COVID um, as well, uh, get, came up with this idea to write this book um, about ADHD being a superpower because I really wanted to highlight the strength that I saw on a day-to-day -day basis from my son, strengths of persistence and a hyper focus. So that's a part of ADHD where he can really focus in on something and just create like a magnitude of things because he's so intently focused when he's interested in something. Um, so persistence and then his heart, his kindness, his empathy. I just wanted people to see, you know, what I see. So um, I came up with this book and it's a whole, uh, there's a lot of stories, but I went through a lot with his elementary school, got him services. He just wants to do another month. He just came a long way from like in academically and behaviorally. And so, but I, it was a lot of advocating, a lot of fighting, a lot of, you know, me being his biggest advocate, his cheerleader and empowering him and letting him know, 
you know, what God thinks about him and not what society is going to say about the ADHD or his behavior. So, but anyway, we're in a much better place and the book really helped. Um, so yeah, so that's what this, that's how this came to be. Very nice. Very nice. Well, my um, daughter was diagnosed with um, ADHD probably about three years ago. Um, my mom told me pretty early that she felt like she had some of the characteristics or symptoms of ADHD. But as a mom, you know, I did not want to hear that diagnosis, but I'm one of those moms that I'm not going to say, oh, my child is perfect, knowing that my child is not. Um, and then also working in the school system, um, I worked in the EC classes a lot, which I love. Um, so I got to work with different types of students um, of varying ages, varying grades. And I realized that, you know, my daughter is exceptional, just like you realize that your son is a superstar. So um so yeah, I really, really love the ADHD is my superpower. I thought that was an amazing <laughs> title. Um, and I wasn't sure if it was about you or if it was about someone that you knew. Um, so now knowing that it's coming from you being a mother, um, I, I love it. I love it. Um, we had Miss Carla Carlisle on a couple of weeks ago where she um, published her book, um, A Journey to, uh, to My Son. Um, she adopted um, her son who came from a pretty bad background. And so she's having to advocate for him. Like you have to advocate for your son and I have to advocate for, for my daughter because they deserve that. But also, so they're not treated like they're abnormal or that there is something wrong with them. It's not that there's something wrong. It's just that they have this extra energy, this, this, this extra superpower that people just need to educate themselves about and right. who better to educate them than their parents us so exactly. I love 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 your book I'm gonna have to get your book myself for my daughter so that we can read it um so tell me how does he feel about your book how did he feel when you wrote this awesome book and it's about him uh, he feels very empowered and it's really sweet I it got published in August but every day he's like Oh, this, um, if he hears ADHD, he goes, does that person have ADHD superpowers like me? And he just gets really excited. And he, he says it every night, like, I, uh, my mind is so creative. Or he like quotes the book, my mind's creative. I'm, I'm hardworking. I have a big heart. I'm like, you do. So he love loves it. it. And, and I love that he loves it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And what a big example to him for him to know, you know, hey, I have this diagnosis and, you know, it's okay. Because I can do this and I can do that and I'm exceptional at this and I'm great at this and I'm super at that. So I think that is a, an awesome, awesome way to empower your son and our children about having this diagnosis. Um, I know for my daughter, when she found out about her diagnosis, she started using it for why she can't do her homework and why she can't, <laughs> why she can't do this and why she can't do that. And I was like, no, that's not the way we're going to do that. Because if you start using it as a crutch and if you start mm -hmm. using it as an excuse for certain things, then other people are going to start doing that. And that's mm -hmm. not what we want. So we're going to, we're going to reverse this around. So, um, so yeah, things are much better now. Um, she'll, she'll say, even though I have ADHD, I did that. Um, so I'm teaching her how to advocate for herself and so forth. So um how, what has the response been from your family and from the community um it's been really huge um similar to Shalia I was really just writing it for him um and because I just wanted him to have something that god forbid everything ever something ever happened to me I wanted him to know you know what I thought of him and how great he was so it was really supposed to just be for him and then hundreds and hundreds of books later it was it was a it was a very blessed response. I mean, not just people, a uh, huge response from my support system and people that know us, but also a phenomenal response from everyone, adults that said that they really needed to read it, people that didn't have ADHD that said, I really needed to have this perspective about it, just all these different people. And then I found ADHD parent pages as well, which was awesome. And then that was very useful to several parents with ADHD. 
adults with ADHD, people without like, it was just, it's just been a blessed response that I totally did not expect because I didn't even intend to write it for everybody. But I guess God said, this is for way more than just, uh, just him. So right. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, there, and unfortunately there's so many children who are diagnosed with ADHD, but a lot are misdiagnosed too. Mm -hmm. So you have the teacher who says, you just won't sit down. That's, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that it's ADHD or, right. you know, a parent that says, you know, he, he won't, he won't do his homework. I can't get him to sit down and do his homework. That doesn't mean he has ADHD. So right. I think, um, yeah, you definitely bringing awareness to it and the, the, the pluses to, you know, having a child with these exceptional superpowers. Um, like I, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and I cannot wait to tell my daughter about it. Um, I'm in several Facebook groups of moms of children with ADHD or adults with ADHD. So I'm definitely going to be sharing this book in those groups. Um, they were probably in some of the same groups too. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Probably so. I'm going to share it because, you know, it, it's a topic that a lot of parents are dealing with and, and our children. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank you so much for writing this book. Definitely. It's definitely needed. I appreciate you. All righty, Miss Jeffrey, you ready? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Miss Jeffrey. So we have um, your book, and I'm sorry, before we move on, Miss Alana, I wanted to share my screen um, so that we can see your book because I do not. Where's it at? E -e -e. Y'all see my- I think my, it's the Amazon, yeah. There it is, okay. <laughs> so ADHD is my superpower right here. So I wanted to make sure that people saw the cover um, because I do not have a physical copy. Mr. Mr. Mail messed up me getting my, my copy. <laughs> so we have ADHD is my superpower. Um, does this look like your son? Um, so kind of, so <laughs> not exactly <laughs> like him. But um, the illustrator took a, uh, an outfit that he was wearing uh -huh. and he made it into that. So anyway, the illustrations are still really good. And they very definitely, nice. the whole story reminds me of my son. So it was good very for nice. me. <laughs> very nice, very nice. So I wanted everybody to see a picture of it. Um, I know you held up one. This is also um, the cover so that everybody can see it. Very cute, definitely very, very appropriate for the, for, um, the title. And again, ADHD is my superpower. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Miss Jeffrey, tell us about you. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, yes. So, um, I uh, have uh, an education background and a legal background uh, and a writing background. Um, so, um, as I was writing uh, this book, I was able to draw on all of those things. Um, I'm a graduate of UC Berkeley, uh, and um, I am also a graduate of Vanderbilt University Law School uh, and uh, Fortune School of Education, uh, where I got a master's degree in education. Um, I currently uh, teach uh, legal studies at Delta Community College, and I also teach uh, in the uh, Stockton area um, high school. Um, and I live for a time in the Pacific Northwest, and that's where this story is set. Um, and uh, just more about me and my bio on uh, the website for the book, wildasilva.com. Um, but uh, yeah, um, when I was writing, oh, I also um, had a, a column, a regular column in the Sunday Morning News of Oakland, California. Uh, that's where uh, some people might uh, re recognize me. Um, but as I was writing this, uh, this story, um, and uh, it's a first person narrative, uh, I kind of had to go back in time in my mind to go back to that place where I was 11 years old. <laughs> um, and uh, this um, story is inspired a lot by some of the people I've known um, throughout my life. Uh, a lot of the young people um, I've known, and um, and it's a fantasy. And I always I I like stories. I like fantasy stories that um, 
are a little bit relatable that have some real world elements and some real challenges that young people are going through. Uh, and the fantasy takes you away to another world. Um, and so that's what this story does. And, um, and it's um, a first person uh, narrative is about a, a transplant who's from the Bay Area, um, a daughter of a single parent uh, living in the woods uh, and, um, and some of her uh, friends and some of her challenges in school, fitting in, being bullied, um, the issues she has to deal with around alcoholism um, that uh, she experiences um, but also how um, she's able to lean on her talent. Um, so this is a, um, an 11 year old girl who learns how to be strong. She learns how to be brave. Uh, she's a musician, a, a very accomplished musician. And um, she learns how to recognize her own talent, um, how to do that for herself uh, and how to share it with others. And she also uh, learns how to reach out for help, how to ask for help, um, and uh, how to know which which are are the kinds of secrets you keep and which are the secrets that you really need to tell. Uh, and so it's a story that's for young people, it's written for young people, um, and a middle grade uh, illustrated novel. Uh, and um, it's um, it's a story that I think any, anyone of any age would enjoy. Um, but um, it's not just about her arc as a person, but also I wanted to have a fantasy that was multicultural. And when I was growing up, um, when I was growing up, there were um, not a whole lot of fantasies that had a lot of uh, diversity in them. And it did really reflect the world around me. And so I would imagine in the fantasy world, you would have even more diversity. Um, and so I have a lot of diversity in the story. Um, there's, um, there's an African king um, and um, queen, an African um, princess. Um, there's, uh, there are elves from Scandinavia and Australia, I really did a lot of exploration to find out what are the myths around the fairy world and what are all the different cultures that have had um, stories like this about um, fairies, and elves and things like that. And so there's um, a Native American um, queen, a water sprite who lives under a river and just all kinds of really fantastical things, but I try to get as um, try to try to make it be a modern story. Uh, and so, you know, the, the the kids have cell phones; they are living modern lives, um, but there's still a fantasy element, so so that it's a little bit more relatable. And if you go to the website uh, wildasilva.com. Uh, and if you um, if you order a book, there is a giveaway uh, with this podcast. But if you order the book, then you get an opportunity to also get a, a free bookmark with your order. This was um, designed by the illustrator. So it's an illustrated novel. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm excited to, to do that it's for a limited time, though, um, if you do order it and um, the illustrator uh, produced this. Uh, bookmark just for um, just for this limited opportunity. <laughs> uh, there's also a uh, book trailer that I did, and so you can also go on the website and take a look at it. It gives um, a glimpse of a scene from the novel and sort of the uh, general themes of the novel. Uh, Wilda Silva is a secret keeper, and she's keeping secrets for um, <laughs> friends and secrets, uh, family secrets. Um, but she also uh, learns, you know, can you get into even deeper trouble by keeping the secret? So um, who do you trust and can you trust yourself as well? Very nice. Very nice. Um, I'm looking at the at the bookmark right now. We're sh I'm sharing it on the screen so everybody can see it. Um, very beautiful. 
And I'm assuming that this is the same character that's on the book cover. And yes. what is your main character's name? Or what is her name? Uh, her name is Wilda Silva. Okay. And uh, her best friend is Avery, who's also on the book cover, Avery Jones. Mm -hmm. um, and Avery Jones is a, a really interesting um, character. He, he is an African-American boy um, who is uh, very responsible. He's um, a sort of a peacekeeper on campus at their middle school. He's the hall monitor. Uh, and he, <laughs> so he's somebody who um, stands up for justice and doing what's right. Um, and um, Wilda herself, she's a very talented flutist, uh, but um, she lives with a single parent um, and they live way out in the woods. Um, she kind of tells the joke in the story of, um, she moves from San Francisco because they got basically priced out of the Bay Area and now a cabin in the woods is what they could afford. Oh, um, okay. It's a place they went to for a vacation and now that's where they're living. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she talks about how her mother tries to smooth this over. You know, now you get, we get this adventure, we get to be in the woods and you know, that's not really how she sees it. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, the story, I think, uh, is, um, I think it'd be interesting for, um, for a lot of reasons. There's a, a lot to it. As you, you held up the, the book. It is a pretty, uh, pretty thick book. So it would keep a young person reading for a while. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, 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 it's a pretty, it's a pretty big book. <laughs> it's a um, big book. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, but I saw the illustrations, which I was showing, um, which I was showing earlier. So it does have illustrations. Um, it is big type, mm -hmm. so it's not tiny. So it's very easy to read. Um, it does have pictures in it, which I love. Um, not too many pictures, but there are pictures. And I think pictures definitely do justice in a book like this to not only um, uh, you know, give the person a chance to take a break, but also to see where the characters are at that moment in the book. Um, so I know that that's something will definitely be appreciated by any reader, especially young readers. Um, I'm really excited to get this book for my daughter. She is a fantasy reader, um, but also some of the, the trials that Wilda deals with and her friends are things that I know that my daughter can relate to. So mm. I can't wait to get it for her um, and share it with her. Um, is this your first, well, did you say this was your first book or? This is uh, my, my first novel. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, it's my first novel, and uh, I, I uh, previously have written um, a column in a, a newspaper. I've, uh, I uh, wrote Race Car Dad, which is a, another story. It's a, um, a children's book, uh, which I will be re-releasing uh, this summer. Okay. Um, and uh, this book, Wilda Silva, Secret Keeper, is the first of a series. Uh, okay. So we're going to, um, you're going to learn more about, uh, about Wilda and her, her friends. Um, Avery, her, one of her friends has to make some big decisions. And this is actually the first story that I, I know about that actually has Aziza fairies. And Aziza uh, were um, the fairies uh, from the culture of Benin. Um, and I, I had never seen that in a story before um so um it it uh has lots of different cultures represented in this fantasy uh it's a fantasy for everybody so i really wanted to expand it and not just have minor characters diversity with minor characters who don't really matter much in the plot and don't really push it but um major characters uh, there's the chai chana sisters who are thai um, who are uh, major factors in the story as well. Um, and so I'm really, you know, I'm creating a series for um, children today, a series that uh, can speak to um, lots of lots of children. Very nice, very nice. Um, I, I love it. Um, and the reason why I love it so um, so much is the fact that it is multicultural. Um, I think that that's really important, especially with 
you know, ha having a multicultural family myself um, and just being in the school system, the community, um, very seldom, and maybe this is just my experience, my life experience, but I don't think I've ever been in a neighborhood that was all one color. I don't think I've mm -hmm. ever been to a school that's been all one color. Um, I don't think I've ever worked anywhere that's all one color. So, I, so having a book that shows um, multiculturalism in the book, um, describing the characters, strong characters, I think is really, really important, especially for our children nowadays. Um, are you a mom yourself? I, I'm not a, a parent, but I have taught every grade level from kindergarten to college. Very nice. Uh, so you have, uh, you have thousands of kids. <laughs> yes, yes, thousands of kids. Uh, and, and the story has teenagers in it. There's, there's young children in it, there's adults, there's everybody. Um, so yeah, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm really excited to break some stereotypes as well. You know, and Avery um, being uh, a really smart boy who's, who's kind and good and, and a little bit nerdy, you know? Um, mm -hmm. It's nice to have uh, an African-American nerd once in a while in the story. <laughs> that's what I was growing up. And so, um, and, and the Chachan, Chaitana sisters being very popular at school and being very outgoing and, you know, um, just showing young people themselves so they can see themselves in the story is important to me. Very nice. Well, that's important to me too. So I definitely appreciate you writing um, Will the Silver Secret Keeper. I cannot wait to give it to my daughter. Um, and um, I will definitely have her do a review. We both will. Great. <laughs> this be a way for me to have mommy time with her. She's 13. So she's, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that my daughter is a mama's girl because I'm still getting hugs and kisses and her wanting to spend time with me. So I have to enjoy it while I can. <laughs> <laughs> We turn before she gets a car and doesn't want anything to do with me anymore. So, um, <laughs> so um, thank you so much for sharing your book. Um, thank you for closing closing out with us. Um, thank you for being patient <laughs> with us. Um, we got through. Thank you for books. having me. Yeah, no problem. We got through some really, really um, big topics. And we end it with fantasy with big topics because you're talking about a lot too. You're talking about multiculturalism. Yeah. You're talking about acceptance. You know, you're talking about you know all kinds of things in this book that our kids that our kids are going through right now. So um, I think this has been a phenomenal um, showcase of authors. Um, I'm very very proud of everybody on here. I'm very impressed with everybody on here. Um, sharing your stories, sharing your backgrounds, um, sharing your passions. Um, and I, I just, I just love it. I love it. And I'm not going to say that y'all are better than my first showcase. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm not going to get messages, but what I am going to say is that I think that this, this, um, this showcase showed so many different personalities, so many different viewpoints, so many different races, so many different cultures, so many different backgrounds, ages, everything. Um, and I love that we have three men on our, our showcase tonight. Um, I love when men step up and, and show us what, what, what they got going on um, and that y'all are willing to share your lives. You know, I, I'm just gonna say this. I've always loved a man who can express himself. And I think a lot of women feel that way because so many men hide their emotions and they hide their story. And we don't know what's going on with y'all. It's y'all now. <laughs> so um, that's one thing that I've, that I've always been attracted to when it comes to men, especially especially black men, no offense, Mr. Pullen, no, no offense to you, but especially black men that you, that they can speak and say, this is how I feel. This is what I've been through. And this is my journey, whether it's been good or bad, you know, yeah. whether you, you've had an addiction, whether you've been locked up before, whether you, you know, have been, you know, a victim of abuse, being able to share that um, openly, I think is, something that um, you guys should definitely be applauded for and should be very proud of. And my queens, thank you so much again for sharing your stories as well, because um, whenever a, a queen steps up and talks, everybody listens. 
So I really, really appreciate you sharing your stories, um, especially your personal stories, Ms. Moore and Ms. Um, Shalia, and then also you, Ms. Jeffrey, for sharing um, your beautiful book. It is a beautiful cover. Whoever drew this cover is it's, amazing. Uh, I, have to, I have to say it's Nasima Amir. That's Nasima the illustrator. Amir. Nasima Very nice. Amir. It is gorgeous. It is gorgeous. She did, a she did all the illustrations. Yes, yes, she did a phenomenal job. Um, so um, tell her thank you as well if, if she's not listening and let her know that we truly appreciate um, the her drawings because um, she did a, a phenomenal job. It's beautiful. It's a very beautiful book. Um, so this is where I give away books. So I was writing them down because I'm looking at who's watching, who commented, who shared, who who hearted, who liked. And so <laughs> I think that I picked people pretty well because I know a lot of people who've been watching and then I saw some new faces as well. So I think I picked, I picked good, hopefully. So we're gonna go ahead and give away books. So the first one we're going to do is a message to a fatherless generation by Shafiq Amin. So let me see who I did for him. I don't even know why I'm looking because I'm pretty sure I know who it is. Yes, it is. So um, Mr. J. Locke won your book. Mr. J. Locke, I'm about to tag him right now so you can see who he is, Shafiq. Um, and I'm putting in there that one Shafiq Amin's book. So in the comments, I will make sure that I tag all the winners so that you can see who it is that won your books. So Mr. J. Locke is the founder of Alpha Men Care. So he um, has personally um, developed products for the beard, start off with the beard, but now it's hair care, skin care, and everything. Um, and I truly, truly, and he's been on our mail panel that I mentioned earlier. I truly, truly believe that he will enjoy this book. So Mr. J. Locke has won your book, Mr. Shafiq Amin, The Message to a Fatherless Generation. Thank you. You are nice. welcome. You are welcome. Okay, so next up, and I see he's watching, so he heard his name. So Mr. J, I will make sure that we get that book out to you, and I know he's going to hold me to it. Mr. <laughs> J. Locke has won um, A Message to a Fatherless Generation. Our next winner is doo -doo 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 -doo, Mr. Matt Pullen's book. And I have put down the winner of your book is Mr. Damien Dash. Mr. Damien Dash won yeah. your book. So I will put that in the comments right now. Um, and this is me trying to type. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so Mr. Damien Dash has won your book, Mr. Um, Pullen, and that is Seven Broken Souls. Now, Damien Dash is a not your average therapist. That's what he calls himself. He is a counselor. And so I think that he will definitely enjoy your book, Mr. Pullen. Um, the counselor, he's um, a Black counselor. He, he calls himself not the average therapist because if you see a picture of him, he is tatted out. <laughs> and, and he's a black counselor so he's not your average counselor because when you go into a counseling office you don't expect to see um a man that looks like him but he's <laughs> an educated man he's a powerful man um he's a, an amazing person he's been on the podcast several times and i know that he will enjoy your book so mr damian dash is going to get your book mr Cullen. i know it's cliche but you can't judge a book by its cover that is true. And when you see him, you will know exactly what I'm saying. And he's a phenomenal person, a phenomenal friend. And I know he's going to love your book. I definitely know he will. All right. So next up is we're going to do a page turner, a person that it took me a second for me to catch on. <laughs> so a page turner, Mr. Turner. Um, I have Mr. Abdullah Shabazz. So Mr. Abdullah Shabazz, I mentioned him earlier. He was the veteran that came on our podcast before talking about his story. So because you have something in common, I think that he will love your book. 
So Mr. Will. Shabazz has won your book, Mr. Turner. And that is now in the comments so that you can connect with him. But all of the books that I have here, I'm gonna personally mail out. So Mr. Abdullah Shabazz, you have won Mr. Turner's book, uh, The Emancipation of Limits, Emancipation of Limits. Our next winter is, you see I'm trying to hold your book, Ms. Jeffrey, because I'm trying to steal it for myself, but I am gonna give it away, I promise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so we did that, we did that. So. Um, my book, uh, Reality Check, I am giving to Mr. Miss April Carey. She came in and she loved, she was watching for a while. Miss April Carey, she is going to get my book, Reality Check. And I got that down in the comments so I can remember everybody that is winning. So Miss April Carey, you have won my book, Reality Check. Miss April Carey, we have been friends for a long time. And there's no So she's getting it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that is the winner of my book. Let me see. I feel like I'm missing somebody. Who am I missing? Miss Alana. Okay. So Miss Alana, the ADHD is my superpower. Can you hold that up for me? That book right there, I am going to be giving away to Miss Carla Carlisle. She's the, the author that I spoke to you about who wrote A Journey to this, uh, My Son. I think that she would really, really, really enjoy your book with her son as well. And I know that she also will reach out to you to probably do some collabs with you. So I think that would be a very good connect for you. Please do. Thank you. You are very, very, very good. You're very, very welcome. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I know that she will love your book. I know that her son will love your book. And I know that she's the type that she will reach out to you and do some collaborations with you. Um, and if, if nothing else, she's going to support you. So thank you so much. And um, Miss Carla Carlisle has won Miss Alana Moore's book. Who am I forgetting? I'm just me, I think. Miss Shalia, yes, Miss Shalia. So your book, do you have your book with you? I do. Okay, so we have your book and so tell us the name of it because I don't have it in front of me, I'm sorry. Little girl, little girl, don't get lost in this world. Yes, yeah, so Miss Mariah, or Maria, Mariah Gerito, and I'm probably saying her last name wrong, Gerito, but she um, was a single mom. Um, she is now a... Uh, a talent, talent director, author. She does fashion shows. She manages um, models. Um, she's a mom. Um, I think she's going to love your book because I feel that you guys, the two of y'all are going to be, be able to relate to each other. Um, so Miss Mariah is the winner of your book. Perfect. Yes, ma'am. And last but not least, because I can't keep it for myself. It is the Will <laughs> Secret Keeper. <laughs> um, <laughs> Y'all saw I was trying to keep it, right? <laughs> so the winner of your book is Miss Tara Long. Miss Tara Long is the mother to, I believe, two two children, two children, um, and they are school-age children. I know that they're going to love this book. Um, she was also on my board with Butterfly Visions Project, my organization that um, advocates for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. She is a healthcare um, advocate as well. She is advocating for um, Medicare for All so that everybody will have health, health insurance, health coverage, um, and like I said, she's a mom, she's a phenom phenomenal advocate. She has a lot of connections and I know that she will support you and I know that her kids will love your book. So great, Lisa, enjoy. Lisa, Secret Keeper is going to Miss Tara Long. Miss Tara Long. Yeah. Yes, so I believe I got everybody covered. Do I have everybody covered? I think so, yep. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being on our showcase. And um, I just want to let everybody know that our next showcase is on, I believe, April 
fifth, but I will check right now. Um, yes, April 5th. And we will be doing it again. That will be our third author showcases showcase. We've had authors on our show before and, um, but not to this magnitude. We've had them individually. We might've had them on a panel, but not in this magnitude where we're having several authors talking about their books and sharing their books. So I want to thank you so much for everybody that came on tonight. Please share this, um, this live on your pages um, throughout the week so that people can um, be exposed to the rest of the authors that were on tonight. Um, I appreciate every last one of you. All of you are phenomenal in your own way. All of you have something to offer. All of you are amazing <laughs> authors. And I cannot wait to see what else you do, whether as an author, whether as a community leader, an advocate, a father, a black man, a white man, <laughs> whatever your story is, <laughs> doesn't matter. I cannot wait to see what it is that you have um, going on with you. And please, please, please share. Please share with me what you're doing so that I can share it um, with our audience. We have a, a growing audience every single day um, that are going to want to want updates. And so I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what it is that you all do in the future. And thank you so much. So thank you everybody for watching the Speak Up and Inspire series affectionately called the SUIS. And we will see you again soon. April 5th, if you are an author and you want to be on our platform, please reach out to me. We still have a couple of more spaces. So if you're an author, you want to talk about your book here on the Speak Up and Inspire series, please reach out to me personally and we will definitely get you on. We are also doing a children's author showcase as well. And I'll tell you that one very quickly. That one is going to be on... Let's me see, let's me see. I should have had these dates before I got on here. Okay, so April 5th is the next author showcase. August 2nd is the children's author showcase. So if you know any children under 21 that have written a book, have published a book, please let me know so that we can get them on on August 2nd because it's not just about us, it's about our children too. So everybody, thank you and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. You're Good welcome. Night.